thank you for everybody for sticking around for this last panel. Um, I think this one is, is probably the obvious one for everybody. Quite simply, what's the end game when it comes to North Korea? Um, all the different issues we've been talking about today, the, the North Korea's nuclear program, uh, diplomacy, there's just a lot of things that are on the table. So right now, just a couple things I just want to get out of the way, very small housekeeping things. We are live on the record, but we are also on Facebook Live. And as General Gregson pointed out, we have 1.8 million Facebook Live or Facebook followers. So obviously big potential audience. Uh, this is being streamed for, for posterity and all that good stuff. So lots of questions, obviously, when it comes to this concluding panel and, and where things are gonna go. And obviously in the last couple of days, and last few hours we've had some news about different developments that are happening we had general mattis just giving a press conference i've gotten only to peek at it a little bit but it seems like joint military exercises will continue in some capacity so we've, we've got that going on we had over the weekend um, another sort of belligerent op-ed from the north koreans um, so we've got that problem and there's actually a report today in cnn suggesting that north korea could resume missile and nuclear testing so Seems like we're sliding back a little bit from the diplomatic approach, which is a little bit you know, disconcerting, obviously, for many reasons. So quickly, the, the questions we're gonna ask today, very simply, what are the chances of North Korea truly giving up all of its nuclear weapons? If not, can the Trump administration live with while containing and deterring a nuclear DPRK? Is there a possibility that the maximum pressure campaign, if increased, could lead to the destabilization, destabilization of North Korea? Will China, if they apply maximum pressure, um, you know, be able to, to bring the North Koreans to the table. So I think we've got a, a lot of different questions here. And my goal in, in working with the Korea Foundation, who's generously helped us with this whole full day event, is to try to bring some different voices together and get some different answers and maybe debate some of those answers. And then with your question and answers, we can sort of draw that a little bit more. So to start this off, I'm gonna start with, with Joe Srencion, one of my good friends. Um, He's a, a fixture on MSNBC and in different networks. Uh, President of Plowshares Group, I think everybody knows him very well. Joe, solve the problem for thank, us. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, solving the problem is, is getting more difficult, <laughs> not less difficult. Uh, I was, um, before the Singapore summit, uh, of the people in the field, I was in the optimistic camp. It was a very small camp. But I, I was there, and I thought that, that Donald Trump might have stumbled onto a, a winning formula he, here by flipping the script, by putting the incentives up front, by putting the presidential summit reward up front, that he might have inadvertently created the incentives that could allow Kim Jong-un to do what he seemed to want to do, which is to pause his nuclear program and to use it as a bargaining chip for greater economic and, and diplomatic uh, assistance from and breakthroughs with the West, particularly the United States. That, that seemed to be the game that was afoot. And when Mike Pompeo became Secretary uh, of State and started his, revealed his secret diplomacy, my hopes rose even more. And I thought, well, Mike Pompeo is an extremely capable uh, actor here. I mean, this guy, I mean, look, he went from a, a, an obscure congressman to secretary of state in, in two years. This puts Francis Urquhart to shame. <laughs> this is a remarkable play on, on his part. And he spoke with such confidence, and President Trump spoke with such confidence that I thought, okay, they've got a deal. Surely they've, mm -hmm. they've got a deal here. They wouldn't be talking this big if they didn't have something. So. Dr. Terry and I were up at MSNBC. We pulled an all-nighter yeah. up the, the night of the summit. Right. And I, I was uh, on live with Chris Hill about 2 a.m., 3 a.m. in the morning when we, Gordon was there too, when we, got the, when we got the communique, when we got the text of it. Remember, the, remember how they got it? He had held up the, yeah. the document that he signed, and within about 10 minutes, people had copied it and translated it and written it, written it out. And we thought, this is, this is it, this can't be it. There must be another page. <laughs> it, was, it was stunningly vague. It was far less than we'd gotten in other communiques. And I, I felt my heart sinking. Chris, Hay, Chris Hill had always been more, more pessimistic. I think you were too, but I was, I was dumbfounded. 
And un unfortunately, I think our diplomacy has only gotten worse since then. And so I would say that the greatest obstacle to, to, to getting a deal is not North Korean duplicity or intransigency. It's not uh, Chinese gamemanship. It's this administration's incompetence. That they have revealed a level of incompetence that, that I, I just didn't anticipate and didn't expect with some of the personnel that they put in place. And every time they seem to be improving their hand, for example, appointing an extremely capable uh, a special envoy to North Korea, they, they seem to sabotage themselves the way President Trump did by canceling a meeting 24 hours after it had been announced. Uh, as the Washington Post put it, there's a way to make a deal with North Korea, but this isn't it. That was their headline, I think, today in their, in their editorial board uh, comment on the Korean. I think there is a deal. Can you get to zero? Can North Korea, will North Korea give up its nuclear weapons? Uh, uh, the chances of that are quite small. I wouldn't say they're zero. I wouldn't give up, but they're quite small. And they get smaller every day as the North Korean position sort of develops, as their position gets stronger, as the Chinese position gets stronger, and all the things you've just discussed, as the U.S.-South Korea alliance gets weaker, mm -hmm. as this administration gets weaker. I do not see this administration getting stronger. I think we've... We've already passed the, the point of maximum strength, the point of maximum leverage, and I mean that in two senses, both vis-a-vis -vis North America, uh, uh, North Korea, then vis-a-vis China, and just political power for this administration. It is, it is going to get weaker from here, both because of political developments in the United States and because of the, uh, the, 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 the investigations into this administration, which are ga gathering steam, and when that happens, that undercuts a president's ability to implement a strong foreign policy. So I, I, I think North Korea still does want to make a deal, but not the deal that this administration is offering. If there's no way they're going to agree to, to eliminate 50 to 70 percent of their nuclear weapons in a year, which I understand the position is, there's no way they're going to do that. Why should they? And get what for it? There's got to be, a, it's, it's real, if there's going to be a deal, it has to be more of the step-by-step -step approach. A variation of it that most people have talked about. If the entire deal, if the process completely collapses, if, no, if North Korea goes back, and I'll wrap up real soon, if they, if they go back and start testing again, you know, people say that North Korea hasn't taken the steps it promised. No, no, no. They, they have stopped testing long-range ballistic missiles. That is a major give. They have stopped testing nuclear weapons. That is a major give. They have taken steps blowing up a test site a major give, not irreversible. None of this is irreversible, but those are major gives. You do not want them to go back in that path. You would like to consolidate the gains here and try to work forward. Could, if all that fails, could we contain and deter North Korea? Well, of course we can. I mean, we've been doing that since there was a North Korea, m m more or, or less. And since they've had nuclear capability of some kind in the 1970s, 80s, we've been doing that. Since they had nuclear weapons in the Bush administration, we've been containing and deterring North Korea, and we can do that pretty much indefinitely. As somebody in the previous panel said, uh, I don't think North Korea is going to be the one to fire first. So as Doug has said in previous occasions, if there's a war that starts in the Korean Peninsula, it's going to be the U.S. who starts it. It just isn't in North Korea's interest to, to, to do that. And so the risk you have is then some kind of miscalculation, some kind of desperation, uh, the kind that uh, Jeffrey Lewis so carefully outlines in his new book, the 2020 Commission Report on the North Korean Nuclear Attack in the United States. And if you haven't seen this book, take a look at it. It, ex it examines how this thing could spiral out of control, and unfortunately it begins with exactly the situation we're in now, where, uh, where, where negotiations collapse and everything starts to unravel. So we're entering, in my view, and I'll stop here, we're entering into a very dangerous period where, where not only do you have the prospects for negotiations diminishing, but you have the, the prospects for misunderstanding or miscalculation or risk-taking uh, increasing, and that's likely to continue through the 2020 elections. Thank you, Jeff. Well, Dr. Terry, save us, please. Where, where do we go from here? <laughs> I'm a Chris. I'm a good follower of directions, so I'm going, I've been given 10 minutes, I started my clock, <laughs> to answer four questions, um, and I'll, so that's two and a half minutes per question, um, and I'll try to best answer them. So the first question, uh, which was, it's kind of easy because the question is, 
What are the chances of North Korea truly giving up all, not some, but all of its nuclear weapons program? So on that, obviously, and I think most of us will agree here. I don't think even if you are very optimistic and hopeful, getting to all, getting to zero, I think that's very, 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 very unlikely. Um, and when, when here I'm talking about North Korea, I would say, I'm talking about Kim Jong-un's North Korea. And I say this because I've been getting some pushback by a lot of folks, and it was Bruce, like he, we've been in some meetings where we got some of this thing, with, which is that whenever there is sort of like, oh, I'm, North Korea is not going to do this and that, I, I get pushed back by saying, well, no, you're talking about old North Korea. You're talking about Kim Jong-il's North Korea or the old days. We're now talking about Kim Jong-un's North Korea. And somehow, that Kim Jong-un is a different kind of leader. I've been, I've been hearing this um, by more than a few people. Um, it's an analysis that's out there, that he's different, that he's his own man, that he could, he could, Kim Jong-un could, potentially give up the nuclear weapons program if certain conditions are met, like security of his regime and security of his state, and of course, peace treaty and everything else to guarantee his security. Um, and you know when you press for evidence of Kim being different, you know then you you know you hear the was it the April statement uh, where he told his own people now that there's a sufficient nuclear deterrent that he's going to focus on improving North Korea's economy, um, and that just by meeting with Trump, uh, that he has really shown to his people that he's launching a new era with the United States and South Korea. And I don't disagree because there's a lot of analysis of Kim Jong Un that's out there that I don't necessarily disagree that Kim is determined, or he seems to be determined, to be seen by the world as a modern leader of modern North Korea. Um, you know, you, there's a lot of analysis of his background, his childhood being marked with luxury and leisure. Yeah, okay, he swam in the French Riviera and skied in the Swiss Alps. Um, he's, he has fond memories of going to Tokyo Disneyland with his mother, so that's one of the first things he did is to build an amusement park when he became a leader. Um, and that basically, as a young man, the, the, the reasoning goes, who will rule, who could potentially rule if his health is fine, if he stops smoking, um, next 40 to 50 years, that yeah, it's not unreasonable to assume that he does not want to rule a poor, you know, backward pariah state, that he wants to have some respect, and that he doesn't want to be a ruler of North Korea that's isolated from the world. Um, but what does that mean? So give Kim Jong-un that. So he is sort of different kind of leader and he wants these things for North Korea. But what does it mean still when it comes to the question of denuclearization or whether he's going to really give up nuclear program? Um, so again, back to the April statement when he told his own people that fine, we now have a nuclear deterrent. I, I'm not like Professor Lee, so I don't remember the exact phrasing of everything either. Um, that now he will shift uh, all the focus on building his economy. Um, but again, what does it mean? Like, why does it mean that Kim is willing to now part with the nuclear program just because he wants to improve the economy? I don't think, in Kim's mind, why can't Kim have it all? Right? I think that's the goal. That what Kim basically wants is an economically vibrant North Korean state that is armed with nuclear weapons. I think this is very reasonable to think that. I mean, I would if I'm Kim Jong Un, right? Uh, that is armed with nuclear weapons that does enjoy normalized relations with the United States, and that is accepted by the international community as a legitimate nuclear weapons, or in a responsible nuclear weapons power. And I think that's his goal. And I think to be very, very candid, when we're talking about long-term future, what does the future look like? I think he's on his way of getting there. Um, and that's sort of the reality that I think is, that we need to sort of understand. And I think, you know, having really set this, very low expectation in terms of how things are progressing right now. I think all he really has to do is just kind of do a little bit at a time, give a little bit necessary, and sort of really buy time and wait out the administration. I think he's on his way of achieving his goals. Um, and I think the major problem for us is we don't really have plan B. I, I don't think this administration necessarily have a plan B. And so what happens when this engagement thing fails? Go back to maximum pressure and this talk of preventive strike, you know, fire and fury of last year. I, I, I don't, even maximum pressure is weakening. It's really, it's easy to say, but it's hard to do because we've, we're getting daily reports that China and Russia, they're not implementing sanctions on the ground level. So 
if, if they don't do it, if there's no implementation of sanctions, that's hard to do. And now with all the uh, symmetry and diplomacy that Kim Jong-un's been doing, I mean, it's just harder to get that international community mobilized to really crack down on, on, on the regime. And to go back to this preventive strike talk, this is less credible <laughs> the second time around. And particularly if there is no provocation, and I actually believe that North Korea is not going to conduct another next or nuclear test. They said they're a nuclear weapons power, it's a de facto nuclear weapons state, they've done it, they're like Pakistan, they, Kim, Kim Jong-un's mind, he is, they, they are de facto nuclear weapons power, so I don't think they are, he's interested in <coughs> creating this kind of, this level of provocation. So absent provocation with, in the forms of a missile mm -hmm. or nuclear test, how do we get back to that kind of talk and we are going to look like sort of the crazy people and I think it's just not going to be credible at all. Um, so again, I don't think North Korea will turn to this love that kind. I think Kim Jong-un has shown himself, to me at least, to be very, very shrewd and smart. Um, and I think I, for myself, have underestimated Kim Jong-un, I have to tell you. I, I, you know, I just thought all throughout last year when you saw 2017, just all the, the three nuclear tests, the missile tests, and everything else, I really thought Kim Jong-un was going to continue. Because you know, we kept saying, oh, he has one other hurdle, technical hurdle that he has to cross, the reentry, successful reentry capability, and this and that. He needs to do more. Remember when we were all worried about North Korea conducting an atmospheric nuclear test, and I thought he was going to go there. But he knew just when to stop. He knew it. He, there comes a New Year's editorial saying we have, we have now completed the program, participated in the Olympics, the diplomacy of summit, and here we are. Um, met with Xi Jinping three times, President Moon now for the third time he's going to meet, and met with Trump. I mean, so, He's been quite sure, so I think we should not, I think we would be better off if we don't uh, underestimate this guy. Um, so again, um, I think all he has to do is sort of not create trouble and be on his best behavior of some kind. I mean, he doesn't really even have to make progress on denegradation um, to really sort of buy out time to eventually win this international recognition of North Korea. Uh, as, so to sort of cement this nuclear status like Pakistan, which is North Korea's ultimate goal. So I honestly think he's going to go there. Uh, on the second que question, which was that if this is true, that we're not, we can't get there, could we live with deterring and containing North Korea? And I absolutely here agree uh, that we can, uh, we have. Um, I think we don't really have a choice or so. Uh, this whole preventive mm -hmm. military strike was never the right answer to the North Korean uh, problem. Uh, so if all else fails, we have to pursue this more broad course of strategy that it does involve not only enhanced economic sanctions and political pressure and all this, but this uh, contain and deterrence stra strategy. Um, and since I'm running out of time, I will sort of not get into what containment strategy looks like, but actually last year, uh, at the end of the year, when we were all concerned about this preventive strike, we've been some doing a lot of work, and I know a lot of places have been doing a lot of work on what, what do we mean by containment and deterrence? Because I think that's, no matter what, that, that study has to continue, right? Um, just moving on to the third question, which is where, if there's a possibility that if maximum pressure, if, if increase could lead to destabilization of North Korea, of course it's a possibility, but I don't think that we should necessarily bank on that as a policy, because we've been always, you know, it's like all, as a policy that we want to cause destabilization. I think it has not quite worked. Um, but on this, I, I, I think one of the important things, I, I think, you know, this sort of one policy that I always talk about is this information dissemination campaign. And no matter what we pursue, I think that piece has to be uh, there and very important, uh, both increasing funding and means of information dissemination into North Korea. And really try to come up with a comprehensive, comprehensive strategy to help people of North Korea break the information blockade that has been imposed by the state. I think that should also be there beside the containment deterrence strategy um, in terms of that piece. And then just last, quickly, on the fourth question, uh, at least on the, on the homework sheet that you gave us, um, you, you, had a, you had a unification question. Is it not, no longer true? Um, it might have got dropped. Extra credit, it anyway. extra credit. Yeah. Extra credit, I agree, no, go because for it. On, on my homework sheet, uh, he asked about the unification go question. Go for it. Um, and so I, I think on unification, I think it's a very, very complex issue. Uh, it's no longer something obviously that all Koreans want. Sadly, it's the core South Koreans are generationally divided on the unification issue. My paternal grand grandparents came from North Korea, so you know, I mean, they're both passed away. But every every single time they could apply, they applied to this family reunion thing, which they never got picked, and they, since they passed away. But um, 
obviously for folks like that who, who remember, who came from North Korea, who remember when two Koreas were one country, um, there's no price that's high enough to pay for unification. But I think younger generation who does not remember that sort of ancient history, uh, one Korea was ancient history, does not remember division, or the Korean War, or, or anything, they were just born into this affluent South Korean society, and they don't understand why they have to you know, carry the burden of the cost of unification. Uh, for German unification, it costs 1.9 trillion million trillion dollars uh, for 20 years, and every economist says Korean unification is going to be much more costly. But those of you guys know who know me, you know that this I I stand uh, in terms of the unification issue that opportunities are great uh, for unification. I I think they outweigh the challenges uh, or the cost of unification. So on that question, I, I remain I w I want to stay a little bit hopeful uh, that one day it could be achieved. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Outstanding. Doug McGregor, what say you, sir? Okay, well, you're a tough taskmaster. So uh, I answered your questions, so now you're going to have to hear the answers. All right. So Do I, it. Will, I will refer to my notes. All right. What are the chances of North Korea truly giving up its nuclear weapons? Well, first of all, I support the President's initiative. I think it can succeed. First, in order to achieve anything, you have to formally end the Korean War. This would send a signal to both China and North Korea that a diplomatic solution is sought and not regime change by military force. China, like the United States, wants to avoid military action on the Korean Peninsula. And our friend uh, KJU, I will call him that because his name is difficult to pronounce, <laughs> it doesn't want to end up, uh, I think, like Ceausescu, which is a more plausible end for him than Saddam Hussein or Qaddafi or something. Uh, we absolutely must insulate U.S.-China trade talks and disputes from the negotiations on the peninsula. Uh, the Chinese compartmentalize that way. We need to do it as well. Uh, we need to schedule the turnover of the CFC, the Combined Forces Command, to President Moon and his uh, armed forces as soon as possible. This is an extraordinarily important development. President Moon is not seen as the head of a sovereign state. Uh, he is still viewed as essentially an American puppet. He's got to control his own armed forces and be in control of the Korean Peninsula if he's going to have any credibility. <clears throat> By the way, uh, that was recommended many, many times. If you want to go back and look at previous uh, Combined Forces commanders, General Bell in 2008 said it was essential that we do it as quickly as possible. That's why it was scheduled for 2012. Uh, can the uh, Trump administration live with while containing and deterring a nuclear DPRK? First of all, any residual capability that includes a missile force with deliverable nuclear warheads, ones that can survive reentry, which they don't currently have, is unacceptable. So basically the answer is, from our standpoint, what we are most concerned about, no, we can't accept that. Uh, the presence of light nuclear reactors pose no threat because uh, they can't develop weapons-grade plutonium. Uh, and as a general rule, I would tell you that uh, the nuclear threat from North Korea is grossly inflated and exaggerated, in my judgment. We have to be careful that once we do find out what's there, that we do not publicly embarrass the regime by letting everybody know what they don't have. Is there a possibility that the maximum pressure campaign, if increased, could lead to the destabilization of North Korea? I think the, that condition already exists. Organized crime is rampant in North Korea right now, and living next door to hopelessly corrupt China doesn't help matters very much. And this organized crime extends into the North Korean military, and so I would tell you that with persistent food shortages, illegal cross-border trade, and given the fact that North Korea is an economic basket case, it lags somewhere behind Ethiopia, a sub-Saharan state in terms of its economic productivity, it's already there. I don't know what bottom has to be before we recognize where they are. I think that's one of the principal motivations for what's happening now. Uh, is unification possible at some point? Yes. Uh, if we are willing to sit down and look carefully at, uh, at a verifiable agreement that is tied to the departure of our ground forces. Uh, that has to be part of the arrangement. Uh, voices from the swamp who keep insisting that's impossible and everything must stay the same in perpetuity must be silenced. Otherwise, nothing will change. And the last thing I would say is, there's, it, when you go to Korea, everybody presents you with this analogy that Korea is the shrimp between two whales. Well, I would change that analogy a little bit. I would say uh, 
South Korea, the Republic of Korea, is no longer a shrimp. It's a great white shark. Japan is a killer whale. China is a blue whale that flops up and down and does what blue whales do. Uh, North Korea is a tired, exhausted puffer, ship, uh, puffer fish <laughs> whose venom is no longer really toxic. And uh, if, you, if you look at that uh, sort of power relations, you understand that. And, and finally, I think, I cannot prove this uh, categorically, but I think uh, President Xi, uh, sitting in Beijing, has chosen Seoul for his future strategic partner on the peninsula, not Pyongyang. And uh, there you have it. North Korea, the pufferfish. I like it. That's, that's a new one. So let's, let's go to Q&A now. Obviously, a lot of different contrasting perspectives on the table, a lot to discuss, and we've got about roughly an hour to, to get it done. So who's first? Professor, go ahead, and we'll go around. Dr. Perry, Kim Jong-un is a different kind of leader from his father. In brief five years or six years, he has carried out four nuclear tests, whereas his father did just two. He has carried out three ICBM tests. He has cracked down on border crossers, and the number of North Korean detectors coming to the South has fallen by half during his term, shall we say. <laughs> so Kim Jong-un, I think one might argue, is more ruthless. He has had his half-brother killed. Uh, he has uh, overseen the death of a U.S. detainee, unlike his father, who released them. So one could say Kim Jong-un is even more motivated by his campaign of terror and his calculated provocations. Um, just a comment, and quickly, uh, this question is for Mr. Sirin You mentioned that North Korea not having conducted a ballistic missile test or nuclear test over the past uh, nine months and ten months respectively is a major give, major concession. Um, from December 12, 2012 to February 7, 2016, so for over three years, Kim Jong-un withheld from conducting a long-range missile test and from February 12, 2013 to January 6, um, 2016, so for almost three years, he did no nuclear test. That did not necessarily mean that his nuclear ambitions had dissipated, so I would say, respectfully, it's a bit premature to draw the conclusion that North Korea has given a major concession. After all, these are activities prohibited under more than 10 UN Security Council resolutions. So I think um, perhaps it's a bit early to gauge Kim Jong-un's intentions at this point, only what, a year, not even a year after his thermonuclear test. Thank you. Well, I, I, I don't think Kim, Kim Jong-un, I think he was being, he's, he's basically, no, I, I didn't think that was a question, right, Dr. Lee? Yeah. Um, Kim Jong-un being different. Um, I, I would say I totally agree in terms of ruthlessness. It, it shows, it's true. That was one of the most shocking things when, when just following Kim Jong-un with even, just with even Jang sung Tex execution. And somebody who's a North Korea watcher, who's been watching North Korea and, and purges, this is very common, getting rid of family members, that's always common, Bruce knows. We, but there's a lot of car accidents, people just kind of disappear. So Jang sung Tex execution just showed what kind of man he really you know, what kind of man he really is, that was cr quite brutal, same as Kim Jong, Kim Jong Nam uh, killing his half-brother using banned WMD in a major airport. And how many purges? I mean, we're like, well, to like 100 defense ministers because I lost count. Um, but it is also true that he's different from his father in just in terms of being able to even, you know, just the, the submission of diplomacy, this is why I use the word shrewd to really describe um, Kim Jong Un, and, and just when you look at his body language and behavior, this is that he even, while there's this ruthlessness, there's also like he was he was able to establish some sort of rapport, even with the leaders, right, with Xi Jinping, with President Moon, and even Trump. Seems like there was some sort of rapport that he was able to accomplish. So it's not really a compliment. I just I'm just describing Kim Jong Un as sort of you know that I underestimated some aspects about him that he was able to sort of and, and look how he went around. Um, I think he scored huge points in, in, in last few months uh, when the whole the summit and diplomacy began, and he did. 
just standing there with, with President Xi Jinping, with his lovely wife and President Xi's wife, and just looking like a normal leader of a normal country. He did a lot in terms of image we make. Um, so I, I'm just point out, as brutal and ruthless he is, he's, he's, he's quite shrewd. Um, and there are certain, you know, and, and the people who point out that Kim Jong-un is different in that he wants economic reform, I only add the point, yes, have, yeah, why not have his cake and eat it too? Do economic reform and keep his nose. Makes sense to me. Yeah. Uh, two, two points just to go on that. One, we, we have a history of undervaluing uh, North Korean conce concessions. Uh, they, they have paused testing of nuclear, they have paused plutonium production, they have paused missile tests in the past. We had, under the agreed framework, an eight-year pause in plutonium production. We had an eight-year pause in missile uh, t testing. That's the old, to paraphrase a country music song, we miss them when they're gone. We miss them when they're gone, and believe me, if they start testing again, we're going to miss this pause. Remember, they, Kim Jong-un didn't say this is a pause, he says he has ended nuclear testing, that he has ended long-range ballistic missile testing. Well, I think most of us here would, would agree, he doesn't quite have the capability he says he has. He's got a pretty good, crude, basic ability to put a nuclear weapon on a warhead and hit some place in the United States. But if you really want to perfect that warhead, you really want to perfect that missile, you need more tests. And I'm telling you, the longer these negotiations fail, the more pressure there's going to be from, from the test, from the, the military uh, in there to do another couple of tests on this. And we will have wished that we had had diplomacy smart enough to have kept the pause, to have kept the, 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 the stop on this. One other point I want to, what, what, the issue about pressure, could we restart the pressure campaign? I didn't address this, but. Max Pressure is dead. He died in Singapore. <laughs> he ain't coming back. <laughs> you know, you, you, that's what I mean. We had our moment. The history doesn't stand still. It moves. It ebbs and flows. We had our moment to make a really good deal. We blew it. And I would say we blew it. This administration couldn't quite get it right. And, and, and the longer we go on without a deal, the weaker our hand becomes. The, the stronger the incentives are to, to do, as, as, uh, as Sue says, to just wait it out. Wait the administration out and build up the value of your chits. Yeah, I agree with you, Joe. And I, I think also, too, I think the administration's sort of forced in between a choice here. I mean, because on the one hand, it seems like we're sort of moving towards this policy where we're trying to contain China in lots of different ways. But at the same time, we're trying to figure out what we're going to do with North Korea. and. I think the administration's sort of in a bind. You, you, you can't do both of those things at the same time. You know, you, you can't push China to try and, you know, put maximum pressure on North Korea if you're in the middle of a trade war. So yeah, exactly. Th this, is, this is the conundrum. This, this is what I mean by how it, it, in, amazingly incompetent and inept the administration is at playing the game that they designed, that they, they, they laid out. And it's just, we can still get a deal, I think. We just can't get the kind of deal they're going for. We can't get that big give. We got to lower our sights and, and, and be a little more modest. You know, yeah, it's something to what Joe said earlier. Uh, I don't know if, if, if I wasn't here through most of the day, so I don't know if anyone came in here and actually gave you a presentation on the missiles. Mm. But I think it's important to understand that uh, these things that we're talking about from North Korea are Soviet era rockets. The last one that was fired uh, surprised everyone because it was essentially an extended version of an older Soviet rocket that gave it uh, greater reach. Uh, all of these liquid fuel rockets, and by the way, nobody, I mean nobody, uh, uses liquid fuel rockets anymore. Those things are disasters waiting to happen. They'll, they frequently blow up on the pad. We've all gone to solid fuel rockets. Inside the Republic of Korea's arsenal of surface-to-surface -surface missiles, which are spectacularly deadly and precise and targeted against all of the things people worry about in North Korea, they're, they're solid fuel rockets. Uh, this last one had no warhead. He has never launched any of these Soviet-era rockets or missiles with warheads. And there are real questions about the warhead matter. Building a warhead that survives re-entry is a big deal. Mm -hmm. uh, most of what he's got, he's gotten from the Russians, and the Russians assisted him with this last rocket. We have a tendency to talk about China, China, China. The Chinese are not interested in a war in Northeast Asia any more than the Japanese or the Koreans. Russia is kind of a spoiler. 
But Russia has to proceed very carefully lest it find itself in conflict with China and what China wants in the region. So uh, just, just keep that in mind. Let's not lose sight of the reality of the technology we're dealing with. So Joe Bosco, then Ed Chip Gregson. It seems to me that there's an air of desperation in some of our discussions. We see the alternatives as being accept a nuclear-armed North Korea and live with the consequences of that coercive threat indefinitely, or go back to maximum pressure and risk war. I think Trump has done something that people have not taken enough notice of. He's laid the groundwork for a third alternative and that is peaceful regime change in North Korea. He gave three major speeches on the human rights violations in Pyongyang before the United Nations, the State of the Union, and at the National Assembly in South Korea. <clears throat> he had, he's met with, with the uh, defectors from North Korea. He had one up in the gallery of the State of the Union message. He had a meeting with 20 or 30 of them in his office. He's emphasized that the North Korean regime is unfit to govern. Now, since Singapore, he hasn't come back to that theme, but it's there, it's there. And I think he could go back to the human rights basis for peaceful regime change in North Korea. That would mean the kind of thing as Terry was talking about, information dissemination and a really vigorous strategic communications campaign. But I think that possibility is, is one that ought to be considered. Except it's either or. The problem is, that's fine. If you're all for human rights, and he was doing that, and he went to the National Assembly in South Korea and gave a great speech, met with the defectors. But that's all last year, 2017. And then he met with Kim Jong-un. He said Kim Jong-un was a great guy. And so completely legitimate. Yesterday in a tweet, he said it. So yeah. it's either or. Like you should have either focus on that, if your theory is right, and that's, that could be a theory that he was pursuing but it doesn't quite make sense. So I think part of this administration problem is, even if there's a strategy, if there was a strategy, then this is complete zigzag that's very, very confusing and there are all kinds of mixed signals are coming out. So how can he be a great man that you met with? It's great. And then he's this great human rights fighter. How do we get back by, to calling him this, you know, the guy who commits crime against humanity when you just called him a great, great man? Do you see what I'm saying? You have to yeah. either. <laughs> let, me, let me just ask you. See, I think the problem is it's not, a, it's not necessarily a, a theoretical problem or an ideological problem. This should be the strategy, that should be the strategy. We're, we have to confront the fact that we have a competence problem here, that, they, that, that, that they're, they're unable to execute the plan that, that they designed. And, and, I, and partially, it may, it may, I don't know why. They're distracted, they're, they're disorganized, they're divided, there's certainly big division but they seem incapable of putting together a coherent plan to, to, to deal with North Korea. And going back <coughs> to a regime change strategy there, I'm sure there's some in the administration who want that. I just don't see how you do it. I think, just don't see uh, how you get there from the, here. The notion of even discussing regime change means that there's no chance for this initiative to have any success. Again, we need to go back to concrete steps. We have to listen to what President Moon has been saying as well as what comes out of oh, KJU. Yeah. We need to end the war on the peninsula. That's step number one. Because in the minds of the Chinese and the North Koreans, we're essentially saying we are not going to turn to the use of force to resolve this issue on the, on the peninsula. We're signing up for an end to hostilities, a formal end to that warfare. The next point is that we're making it very clear as Americans that the destiny of the Korean nation rests not in our hands, but in the hands of President Moon, frankly, and that we are prepared to support him. That's the point about the CFC. And then the next point is to put on the table, look, in return for this systematic program, and by the way, when I say systematic program, I'm always struck by people in Washington. Uh, we live in the land, I guess, of instant pudding and microwave dinners, so everyone assumes that uh, diplomacy is a snap. You know, I don't know what happened on that initial meeting uh, with uh, Mr. Pompeo and, and uh, KJU that, that was so unproductive, but I have been told by some of my contacts on the peninsula that we walked in there and we were very definite about what we wanted and essentially pounded on the table and said, you've got to do X, Y, and Z. Well, ladies and gentlemen, for those of you who have never been to Asia, 
That's not how you behave in Asia. They value politeness, even thugs. And if you're going to go in and talk to somebody, recognize he's your host. He drives the conversation. He raises the issues, not you. We, we, we have to have a, a different approach. You know, this business of the Thucydides trap, you've heard of all of that in connection with China. Forget all that nonsense, that's Europe. This is Asia. Asia is different. And we have to understand what's real and what's not. I think we have a problem with that right now inside the Beltway and across the country. The instant pudding thing. This is a, this is a multi-year process. And I agree with Joe, this can absolutely succeed. But it has to be very carefully approached it has to be progressive over time. It has to be tit for tat. There has to be reciprocity. We have to be prepared to respond just as we're asking them to respond. If we do those things, I think we will have a positive outcome. But we've got to get out of this business of saying, well, Trump met in Singapore, it's a deal. No, it's not a deal. It's a beginning. And we need to get back to that and go back and look at the steps that we need to take to have any success, any chance of success. And we need to do something that President Trump has done in the past with China. He has treated the Chinese as equals. It's very important. He hasn't looked down on them. He hasn't treated them as human rights violators. He simply treated the head of state as another head of state with respect. We need to get back to that on the peninsula as well, however distasteful it may be to the human rights advocates in the audience. Chip Gregson next, and then we'll, we'll move around. Yeah, for Dr. Terry, a comment, um, a theory, just a test, and a question. Uh, the, the, the comment is on the on energizing the information campaign, as Joe Bosco also mentioned, could not agree more. We used to be good at that in the Cold War, but we've given up on our biggest lever on talking to captive populations, and when we talk to captive populations, we're making the ruler very uneasy, and it's 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 exactly what we ought to be doing. A theory on the VX attack. Um, the uh, UN sanctions uh, ordered nations housed, uh, hosting North Korean laborers to send them home, but then they, they killed their own case by giving them two years to do it. But VX, as we all know, is a colorless, odorless, persistent agent. It's the worst of the nerve gases. It's certainly excessive for an assassination of one person. Yet North Korea very skillfully deployed and employed an agent, a, a weapon of mass destruction to Kuala Lumpur and executed a very skilled attack where they only killed one person and that's the one that they wanted to kill. Uh, my theory is that this was also, besides getting rid of Kim Jong-nam, this was also a signal, especially to Malaysia and the other nations of Southeast Asia, that if you don't treat our workers correctly, we can reach out and touch you and hurt you. Uh, the third one on the question, what would rapprochement with North Korea, considering all about the nature of the regime, look like? How would, uh, how would you uh, uh, have peace and end the war, as Doug says, with a nation with the fourth largest army and uh, 14,300 uh, artillery and uh, rocket launchers uh, just north of Seoul? What's, what's, what's rapprochement? What's that peace look like? Between U.S. and North Korea? No, between South Korea and North Korea. Please, please, please. First, on the Kim Jong Nam. I was just picking on you because I know yeah. you better than the other guys. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> please feel free to jump in. Yeah. But on Kim Jong Nam, I agree with you that it was a message and signal. The way in which they he decided to kill Kim Jong Nam. I'm not sure if it had to do with laborers or is it a message to the defectors or would be challengers. But it is a signal in that. He didn't have to die in this manner mm -hmm. with chemical weapons. As I said, they usually have car accidents, right? Yeah. That's favorite or just die in bed. You can go to his house and kill him. So that was definitely a signal, although whether it's over laborers, I happen to think it, it had to do more messaging to the would-be challengers, okay. what, what you're dealing with with Kim right. Jong-un. I have the right, I have this. I, I, I have the same question. I don't know what that complete normalization looks like, particularly with South Korea, um, you, you have to sort of let go of a lot of things. I think for United States and North Korea, when we talk about peace regime, you were talking about declaration of end of war. That's an entirely different thing than a peace treaty. I happen to believe that the peace treaty part has to come at the end because that involves 
human rights too. I mean, that's, we have to disagree on that. It, it's not just about the nuclear peace to completely normalize relations with North Korea. It's much more complicated process. You can take steps. The peace regime process is a long process. You can start with the declaration of end of war. But I think the peace treaty, uh, it, it, it has to come at the end, having made some progress on the at least denuclearization front. Between the two Koreas, I mean, maybe you can chime uh, in. Uh, I would, uh, I would agree with you about the peace treaty coming at the end. And I used to say that about the decla declaration of the end of the war, that that would come at the end. As the presidential summit was always supposed to come at the end, but the president has flipped the script. And now the cards are on the table. So I, I would, I think I agree with, with Doug that it's in our interest to early on to declare an end to the war. That would help us implement a yeah. coherent but there's a, very, there's a difference though between, between that yeah. and a peace treaty I yeah. agree yeah. and then there's a whole lot that gets yeah. negotiated there yeah. and so that begin yeah. that becomes your big reward right. still at the end and if, if we're yeah. right that what that yeah. Kim Jong-un wants that then there's some gives that to, 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 to get there uh, just about the rapprochement I actually think the Koreans are driving this process and have from the beginning uh, Kim and moon they're driving this process. It's not China, it's not Trump, and, and they're driving it still. And as the, the Trump administration gets, if you believe my theory, weaker, the Koreans will be driving it even more, and now they have the active assistance of the, of the Chinese. So the action starts to shift more and more over to the peninsula and much less about Washington. But the, do you agree with that? Yeah, no, yeah, I do. Okay, Except thank you. you know, <laughs> no, 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 but the, the issue for the South Korean government is at some point, if there's no progress made between U.S. and North Korea, oh, yeah. if there is a limit to how much they can truly right. push. Right. It's not they can just, they are completely, they have all the freedom in the world because they have to worry about alliance management issues with the United States too. So I think that's a big frustration for the Moon government is that there has, there is a limit. I mean, right. how much so they, they may be driving, right. but we're still in the back seat. Right, and even this <laughs> week when they're supposed to, was it, we opened the liaison office. offices and they have to postpone that decision. So it's not something they can independently mm -hmm. right. pursue. No, but I think uh, if we sign on for this end of, of the war on the peninsula as a precondition for any significant change on the peninsula, that will help a lot. I also think that turning the CFC over to the Koreans is vitally important, and that will change the, the nature of the relationship on the peninsula. Uh, you know, I want to go back to something that General Gregson brought up. Uh, you were talking about the uh, impact of external information on the population. I would tell you based upon my experience in Korea and talking with members of the government and extensively in 2010, there were several things that came through. One is that the people in North Korea are not completely oblivious and ignorant to the reality the way they were 30 or 40 years ago. Secondly, this joint economic zone that was established where North Koreans and, and Koreans from the South were working together, that, that demonstrated several things. First of all, the Koreans that were coming there to work uh, were nowhere, in no way similar to uh, what we experienced with the, the Poles, the Czechs, and others after the fall of the Soviet Union. Uh, they had, you remember they used to talk about uh, we pretend to work and they pretend to pay us? None of that whatsoever. Very, very energetic, very anxious to work. And the Koreans in the South were enormously pleased with that because they see that pool in the north of, of talent and labor as something that can be harnessed to the greater interest of the Korean nation. And then finally, KJU continues to talk about expanding these uh, economic relations on the peninsula. Well, look, the more uh, exposure to the south that the Koreans in the north get, the more difficult it becomes for him to retain his position. His father tried it and shut it down because he saw it as destabilizing. KJU doesn't have much of a choice right now because he's in a far, far weaker position than his father was. And finally, you mentioned this artillery business. There's a report called the Nautilus Report. You can find it online where the South Koreans debunk this. Uh, and not just them, but the Japanese as well were assisted them with it. I'll, I'll be happy to give you the links to it. These artillery pieces are not in great shape. The ammunition in many cases is not there. This multi-thousand, you know, hundreds of thousands of troops. Look, what are you going to do with these people if you don't keep them in uniform? Uh, you've got a real problem on your hands because there's nothing for a lot of them to do. 
And this fourth largest army, look, the, the Iraqi army was the fifth largest army in the world. And, uh, you know, it couldn't stop a toilet from flushing. So I think we have to be honest uh, when you look at North Korea. This is not the North Korea of 30 or 40 years ago, not by a long shot. This place is on the ropes. You need to understand that. We don't want to talk about regime change because I think over time it will happen anyway for the reasons I just outlined. The South is a magnet. Look, it's got a, an economy larger than Russia's. It's about 12th or 13th in the world in terms of uh, GDP or GNP, per capita GNP. Russia is 68th. Uh, I, I, I think that Korea has won, the South Koreans have won the war. The war is over, so let's end it and get down the road and just move progressively towards the goal that we're discussing, ending the conflict. So if the arsenal in the case on Heights is in such bad shape, they should have no problem dismantling it if we declare peace. Oh, I think, it'll, I think they're going to look for reciprocity. And I think that's what Moon is already engaged in. He's so, we can, so we can remove a bunch of old artillery pieces from our side. Of course. I would just get the troops out. There's no, pr there's no purpose to those uh, uh, U.S. ground troops, but now we'll use them as a bargaining chip. But they've been symbolic at best for the last 20 years. Look, there are two ways to see this. If you want to see China as a Soviet-like state that's bent on conquest, that changes the picture. If you want to see North Korea as magically resilient and still holding out this nuclear capability for potential attack, if you believe those things, those are fundamentally different assumptions. I do not. I don't see that at all. And that's why I'm saying what I am. Uh, and I think the world has fundamentally changed. I credit the president with, with having recognized that it's changed and has recognized the need for us to change with it. So a young lady in the corner, then Danny Davis. Mike's coming. With just the foreign policy and uh, diplomacy here, um, you know, you, we're all talking that Trump is incompetent in this form, but, you know, could he be using the maximum pressure, what he's doing now in Iran, in creating turmoil and presumably regime change within a year or two, could he be using that to pressure North Korea and get them to wake up to the fact that, look, the United States is a power player around the, the world, and this will be in their best interest if they come to the table and talk with us sooner rather than later. Let me start. Uh, I'm afraid I disagree with the assumptions of your question. Uh, the president isn't creating turmoil in Iran. The, the uh, Iranian regime is doing a perfectly fine job of creating turmoil in Iran all, all by itself. I, the sanctions that the United States is reimposing on Iran are certainly going to hurt, um, but they've been through a long period of sanctions before. Uh, there's no evidence that those will be decisive in affecting the, the future of the government or in encouraging a popular re revolt. I, I, there's just no, I understand what you're saying, I just don't think there's evidence to, to, to back that, that up. But let's put that aside. It, do you want to do that with North Korea? I would say that causing the collapse in the universe of worst outcomes, the, the causing the collapse of North Korea is a close contender for the worst. You, you, you just don't want to do that. That is not good for South Korea. It's not good for China. It's not good for the North Korean people. It, if you want to talk about the prospects of, 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 the, of, of a war breaking out, I mean, that increases the chance of, of a war. So that is. That, that, is, that should not be the U.S. goal. It, it's against our own interest to cause the collapse of the North Korean uh, government, and China would certainly resist that uh, at all it takes. And as, as I mentioned in the beginning, we don't have the ability to do that. You know, yet the, the game has changed because of what's happened over the, over the course of this year. The U.S. is not going to be able to go and impose killer sanctions on North Korea again. It's hard to imagine another U.N. resolution on North Korea at this point. Um, everything is going in the other way um, uh, uh, as far as pressure. If there's, if someone here disagrees, if, to be, uh, I just don't see how you do that given the position the U.S. is in at this point, uh, apart from the fact of whether you want to do that. Well, I wasn't just saying that necessarily we ought to be in war with North Korea. I'm just saying that if you're looking at a situation that's going on there, that it might 
be perceived in north korea that it is in their best interest to not turn around and become you know the country that nobody wants to talk about i mean we've got there's a lot of change going on and our foreign policy quite frankly hasn't changed for the last 20 30 40 years and i think that maybe as younger people in this country and around the world are you know growing up and learning to be diplomats themselves that i think that maybe it's okay to look at different ways of solving these problems mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i just i mean i think north korea does want a new relationship with the united states they do want to change they do they, they just don't want to do it on the terms the u.s is offering right now and that's what I'm, and that's what the washington post is talking about and there and that's what many of us are talking about there's a deal here to be made there is a path we can take but it, but it requires and this is probably maybe where we disagree in this room. It requires the U.S. to change its position mm -hmm. right now. It's not a question of North Korea changing its position. I think they're ready to give. They're ready to bargain. They just can't do it on the terms the U.S. continues to insist on. And that's why they complain that Pompeo keeps coming and saying the same thing without responding to, to their requests. Hey, Danny Davis, and then please. So, uh, Dr. Terry, uh, you mentioned earlier uh, about, you know, Kim Jong-un maybe want to play for time. And some of the other panelists I've talked to this morning also had the same kind of comment that maybe actually both North and South Korea are playing for time to, to let things play out on a, on a slower basis to build trust, et cetera, to get there. But one of the other panelists this morning also talked about how, from our side, it seems that we are setting the end of Trump's first or perhaps only term as a deadline where something has to be done by then. So the question comes in, what if our, our allies, South Korea and, and our, uh, you know, our negotiating partner, North Korea, want to play for more time, but there's those in here who think that, no, it has to be, we have to get something done much quicker than that while Trump is still in power or whatever. Those two things seem to be coming to a head. And, and well, for Doug and Joe, if y'all want to weigh in on this too, what happens if those two forces come into play where one wants something, think we have to have it now, and the other's like, you know, let's play for five, 10, 15 years? Well, I'm sure folks like National Security Advisor Bolton um, wants to expedite uh, timeframe, but I think Trump and Pompeo themselves hinted now they are willing to, they, they themselves said it's going to now take time. So I think there is a realization with this administration that this is going to be now a process, a uh, much longer process. And I actually think, this is what I go back to the Kim Jong-un's ability or capability. I actually think that, and particularly if there's a declaration to the end of war, um, I think North Koreans know how to just play it so they will give a concession at a time. That still does not lead to a complete denuclearization. You can still make progress incrementally, slowly. That's still buying time. They're still playing out the administration, but not just sitting there with arms folded and do nothing. It's just that you still have to kind of get there by dismantling so and dismantling Punge, like there's, there's things you give some remains, and, and then maybe if there's a declaration to the end of war, you, you incrementally make progress. But they, we, we now admit the verification process is going to take many, many years. We I think there's disagreement exactly how many years, but it's going to take many, many years. So regardless, I think North Koreans play here is to get to some uh, that space in the future where they still have nuclear weapons capability. It just makes sense from the North Korean perspective. And it's not something that's weird or bad. I mean, how many nuclear weapons power really uh, countries give up willingly, right? With South Africa, Ukraine, I mean, there's, but it involves some sort of regime change. It's not something that countries normally do, is right. give up after they have 90, 95% completed their nuclear program. No, I'm completely superfluous on this panel. I agree. <laughs> so, Please, sir. Yeah, uh, actually, the Koreans are concerned about the possible impact of midterm election on Trump's North Korea <laughs> policy. <laughs> you know, then how do you evaluate the, the impact of the U.S. domestic <laughs> politics on Trump's uh, the North Korea policy compared to maybe, for example, the delayed U.S. North Korean negotiation? Yeah, it's 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 enormous. I mean, it, it, you know, it, in most in national international security situations, you can sort of lay out an equation with the various factors and the, and the variables and assign 
uh, quantities to those variables, and you can try to calculate what the probabilities are of, uh, of outcomes. But in this equation now, you have to add at least two other factors that have been absent, and one is the mental stability of the President of the United States. How do you value that? How does that impact on your equation? It is a real question. And it just came up with this, his decision to cancel the meeting that had just been announced. Was that really because of a letter? There's some serious questions about his stability, and you've got to put it in there. However you answer, maybe you say, no, it's solid, you know, but it's got to be there. And the other is the Russia investigations, which are a real force affecting everything else the administration does. And if the, uh, the Democrats regain control of the House of Representatives, the investigations are going to accelerate. In fact, the, there's, there's going to be investigations. You saw the list of possible items that are worthy of investigation that the Congress has heretofore not investigated for political reasons. Well, those political reasons are going to be removed and the investigations will proceed. That is going to greatly weaken the hand of the President of the United States. It's going to greatly weaken the, the hand of the United States in dealing with, with, with North Korea, and therefore, it changes your calculation. So we don't know yet whether the Trump has a long time frame or the short time frame in dealing with North Korean issue because of the U.S. domestic politics? There's a reference here to yeah, 2020. So yeah, I understand that. The, it was clear that the president wanted a big victory going into the 2020 election. So he had a, he had a political motiva motivation for getting denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. Well, okay, that's not going to happen. So um, how... Is he going to be desperate for some kind of victory and do something even more erratic with Kim? It's a complete unknown. I, I, this, this is so far beyond our previous experiences, we, we don't know what to say about it. It's completely possible that there will be another summit with Kim Jong-un. For what? To do what? Because he wants it. Uh, can, I, can I just go around? Uh, very quickly, I, I think that uh, President Trump does realize that this is a long-term uh, prospect. I, I do. Uh, no one has lined up the steps along the lines that I did. And uh, I think uh, they are beginning to emerge. People are not listening to President Xi. They're not listening to KJU. They're not listening to President Moon. Remember, we had this unfortunate condition of national narcissism on steroids. We think of ourselves as at the center of the world, as the, the global military hegemonists. It's a problem. Uh, if we don't control it, if we don't dominate it, we don't like it. That world is over. Uh, I think Donald Trump understands that, but a lot of the people around him absolutely do not. But I think the steps that we talked about, number one, end the conflict on, on the peninsula. The Chinese, we, the North Koreans, South Koreans, we sign it. It's ended formally. That will have a big impact on the North because we're talking about an end to a conflict. There will be no use of force. It's very important. No use of force, as back to what Joe was saying. Mm -hmm. Drop this nonsense about greater pressure or threatening military. It's absurd. No use of force. That's what the Chinese want. That's what everybody wants in the region. And then the second piece is the CFC. And then you talk to President Moon and say, this is your lead. This is your country. We will back you. What has Xi told uh, Mr. Kim, or we don't really know, but if you look at the times when he and Kim have met, Kim has acted very swiftly in accordance with whatever guidance he got from the emperor in Beijing. All right. So I think uh, I, I think we should back away a little bit, but look at those initial steps. Those should be our focus, and then I think there will be progress. Kurt Mills, we're going to go down the line. Like okay. Oh, I don't mean to distract from the topic at hand, but don't go, dovetailing on what. Sorry, right, but Mike behind you, Kurt. Oh, okay. Sorry, I don't mean to distract from the topic at hand, but just dovetailing off what Joe and you were saying, don't we think that a very likely end game of all of this is that the administration is only going to have the attention span and the political capital to focus on one theater at the time? So they've gotten in to uh, the fray here and have tried to do Iran and North Korea at the same time. Don't we think that essentially they have limited leverage unless they want to invade North Korea uh, to handle the issue? And that's just what we're all dancing around, that they, they, they have limited options here, and that's going to frustrate a famously frustratable occupant of the White House, and that they're going to move 
full scale in 2019 towards some sort of move towards Iran where they have significantly more leverage. Thank you. Uh, very quickly, as, as Doug said, no one wants war with North Korea. So sure? none of our allies want to go to war with North Korea. So I believe that if, as this administration weakens and, and devolves, that North Korea will go to the back burner. Right. It, it, won't, it won't, won't be solved, it, it, but it won't be a crisis. It'll, it'll just, and every, because every, it's in everybody's interest not to have it be a crisis. They'll just drop. And to wait. And so then our job here in think tanks in Washington is, okay, okay, what's the next nuclear or, or North Korea strategy? What do we do the next time we have a diplomatic window? How should we handle this? But for Iran, we have allies who do want to go to war with Iran. We have allies who do see that it's time to press their advantage, and they have a willing uh, president who might be ten tempted to wag the dog. So yes, I would say the, if there's a danger of a war over the next uh, uh, two years, I'd be looking at the Middle East, not Northeast Asia. And this is why I say it all fits into Kim Jong-un's timeline, and he works for Kim. And this is why I said from the beginning of my comments, this is all working out for Kim. He's not in a desperate situation here. He looks fine. He looks fine. So, yeah. and so this, is why, this is why I don't necessarily think he's going to pop off a nuclear test right now, because yeah, that would right. backfire. Why would he do that? He's already given what he wants. Yeah. 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 I, I think it's dangerous to play Nostradamus. Uh, I, 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 I don't know what's yeah. going to happen. I, I, I think that all this weakening of Trump sounds like a lot of wishful thinking on the left. Uh, I'm unconvinced. And uh, we'll have to see what happens. But clearly, the, the 7 November is hugely important. Uh -huh. And he knows that. Uh -huh. And that's his top priority between now and the 7th of November. There's no question about it. Don't underestimate his ability to mobilize his supporters. Thank you. Over. National interest. Uh, so I'm going to play devil's advocate here. Uh, two different questions. So first, regarding the question about whether maximum pressure uh, truly is dead. In an earlier uh, panel, Gordon Chang had suggested that the United States could sanction China's four major banks, uh, not just for trade violations and IP theft, but also for the violations of sanctions, and that that could be a way to counter China and to uh, we assert maximum pressure. I'm curious what you all uh, think of that. The second thing is, uh, if you all uh, quickly indulge me, uh, let's fast forward, I don't know, let's say 50 years or something, let's say it turns out, yes, he does do a partial rollback of nuclear weapons. I'm not going to say he gets rid of all of them, pessimistic on that. But, uh, you know, we open up, we have embassies, we have trade, he reforms, wonderful. He turns out to be North Korea's Deng Xiaoping. Wonderful. However, let's say deep down, he still wants to unify. North, South Korea has, uh, they're all aging, the demographics have really, really changed, the alliance is over, we put out our troops. What if it's some point in the future North Korea is very much strong and the situation's flipped, he says, you know what, we're still going to unify, even if it costs militarily. I, I mean, it's far fun, but I'm just, think about it. No, I think it's already on the ash heap of history. I see no evidence that that is even remotely possible. No, I, I, again, I think we need to exercise patience, restraint. When it comes to sanctions, you know, sanctions can do many things, good and bad. Sanctions are viewed in most cases by the target as an act of war. Uh, at this particular point in time, I'm not familiar with all the alleged violations in China. China is hopelessly corrupt. There's always somebody there that's willing to sell somebody something. Uh, Trump has spoken repeatedly about the problems of IP theft and these things. Uh, I think that the best thing we can do is to secure our country, and we haven't done it. Uh, how many tens of thousands of Chinese students and engineers and professors are in this country? What are they doing? We don't know. I mean, I remember these events in the 90s under Clinton at Los Alamos. How, how did people get in? How did they get access to these things? I mean. Trump is right. We, we On that battlefield, and that's another battlefield, we've lost badly. I think we need to win that fight. Whether or not you can effectively sanction these Chinese banks, maybe you can. We've had some success, obviously, in the Middle East. What will, what will the outcome? Will it be a permanent outcome? Will it accelerate anything? Will it help this process? I don't know. And Bruce Klinger, I think, had next. Just a couple points. Um, yeah, on the maximum pressure, I agree with Joe that, you know, the current situation, it, it would be hard to just today say, well, the, the negotiations aren't working out, let's, you know, step up pressure. You know, I think the premature, uh, you know, 
summit, the beautification of Kim Jong-un has all kind of worked against it. Um, but I guess two aspects. One is that, as you pointed out, the world moves on. So if North Korea continues to sort of drag out negotiations, it's hard any one day to say, well, today's the day we say it's not working, let's ramp up pressure. But North Korea also kind of has a history of shooting itself in the foot, even when it doesn't serve their purposes. So if they say negotiations aren't going well, we're going to resume testing, and they do so, then I think you'd have a different yes. situation. Um, but also just to distinguish between you know required enforcement of U.S. sanctions and U.S. law. So it's hard to get particularly China, Russia, uh, and South Korea to fully enforce UN resolution sanctions. Um, but South Korea is more constrained than it was during the Nomi Hun administration because it would not only go against UN sanctions, it goes against US law. And so, uh, and that I think is the main point, is the US law. So, you know, Trump has said he's holding off on sanctioning 300 North Korean entities. That's equivalent to the total number of North Korean entities sanctioned during the entire Obama and Trump administrations. Uh, they're holding off on at least three dozen uh, Russian and Chinese entities. There's the 12 Chinese banks all in violation of U.S. law that we're pulling our punches on. So maximum pressure hasn't been maximum. So we could, using U.S. law, go after Chinese banks as we did after European banks for violating uh, U.S. law, you know, money laundering for Iran. So anyway, there are things we can be doing with U.S. law that we haven't been doing. Um, you know, on North Korean capabilities, I mean, just to, I mean, all the assessments are the Nodong is already nuclear capable. That means South Korea and Japan are already under a nuclear threat. They haven't yet demonstrated the RV, um, but we also have a history of underestimating North Korean capabilities. I mean, in the intelligence community in the 90s, People were denying they had a plutonium program uh, until they no longer could. The HEU program was George Bush's imagination until you could no longer deny it. Even the Syrian reactor, uh, right after the Israeli attack, someone said, well, it's clearly only a SCUD storage site, and anyone who believes it's a reactor is a John Boltonista. Well, it turned out to be a reactor. Uh, people were saying they couldn't you know, have a missile that worked until it did. So. You know, the ICBM now can range all the way down to Mar-a-Lago and beyond. People said they couldn't do that. So, you know, just because they haven't demonstrated it, I'd say, it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Um, you know, and we have already four or five U.S. generals saying they think they already have the ICBM capability, or we have to assume for planning purposes that they have. Um, the conventional force, you know, has degraded over the years, but they still do have a lot. Uh, we cataloged, you know, all the artillery pieces. They're getting new 300 mil MRLs, et cetera. Um, you know, on the declaration and treaty, I, you know, I agree. I don't think we should sign a peace treaty until we reduce the conventional force threat, as we did similarly in the conventional armed forces in Europe treaty. Uh, we need that kind of measure. Even a peace declaration, though, I think has some dangers. Uh, we've given them, you know, non-hostility declarations in the past. It didn't cause any. You know, change in their nuclear program. Uh, we've promised not to attack them conventionally or nuclear, including September 2005. Um, it didn't change their behavior. So, for a peace declaration, I, you know, the question would be, what are you getting in return? Either a direct quid pro quo declaration for declaration, mm -hmm. and then also, what are you getting? You know, North Korea feels less threatened. They feel better. What what actually are you going to get? Or are they just going to pocket as they pocketed all the non-hostility declarations, et cetera. Thanks. Ex exactly. E exactly. Let me, let me violently agree with you. Uh, number one, I, I think everyone everyone here, you wouldn't get any, any denial on this panel of their nuclear capability. So let me be giving my own view. I, I don't that, buy it 100%. Okay, okay then let, let me <laughs> give my I believe that North Korea has the ability to, to deliver multiple thermonuclear warheads on the continent of the United States. Um, degree of accuracy, uh, you know, might be tens of miles, dozens of miles off. You know, as they say, it's counter value. What's what's the value? Value? It's better. You know, I'll, almost almost doesn't count except in horseshoes and nuclear war. Close enough. Uh, if you're developing those programs in North Korea, you want more tests. You, you, you want more precision. I believe they, they probably have high confidence in an RV, but 
you'd, you'd like to have higher confidence. So that's, that's what we're at here. The same for any nuclear program in North Korea is no difference. You want a few more tests to develop the capability. So they, they, they have that uh, capability. Um, uh, on this issue of the peace treaty, uh, um, uh, uh, end of the war, I wouldn't have wanted it this way. I would have wanted the end of the war to be the cherry on the Sunday, you know, n n not not come at the beginning of the dessert. But I think we're in, in a situation now where the president has has left us little choice, and our and North Korea now is demanding this, and South Korea seems to be supporting it, and China is supporting it. So it's difficult not to do this at, at this point. And as we've thought, we've argued, you can get something for it. And here's the final problem: is the United St is the administration capable of getting something for it, or would they just give it away, as you fear, or, or as you? As, I, mean, I don't want to put words in your mouth. As they did with the summit, they apparently just gave the summit away. It was inconceivable that a president would do this, and yet that is, seems to be what we did. We didn't get uh, anything in, in return. So we, it's one of the rare occasions where I'm probably siding with John Bolton and, and Mike Pompeo to say, if you're gonna do this thing, here's what the North Koreans have to sign up for. It has to be clear, whether it's a declaration of, of facilities or withdrawal of forces, but there's gotta be something for it. It can't just be another gimme. I think I think we should be out of gimmies at this point. What do you? Yeah, I agree. I, but, but the problem with also declaration for declaration, it sounds good, fine in theory, um, but what kind of declaration? I mean, they can give anything that and call it a declaration. Oh, yeah, it has yeah. to be. I mean, we have to kind of declaration of nuclear sites. But it yeah. has to be fairly robust and yeah, not so. not a total just paper with a few mm -hmm. things on it. Um, but earlier comment about the peace treaty, the issue I have, you know, is if, you, if there is, they feel confident, it's all, how does it still lead to denuclearization? That's what I don't understand the, the uh, sequence. Yeah. How do we know it will? How do we know that? Who can say that, that that's going to lead to denuclearization? Even if there's a peace treaty, how do we know that? We just, but I guess according to maybe your thesis, that's fine, if, or it does. I mean, I, my point is it doesn't well, lead to, it doesn't guarantee denuclearization you're, look, you're looking for a verifiable regime, and I think that's entirely legitimate. Uh, what the Koreans are asking for is first the renunciation of the use of force through an end to the Korean conflict. That is, a, that is an unambiguous signal to Beijing and to Pyongyang that we are not interested in overturning the status quo with the use of military power. That may not be very important to you, but it's extremely important to them. And it's a precondition for the kinds of things that you're discussing. I think you can come up with a verifiable regime over time. I think you can do a number of things. Again, it's back to this, this assumption that, you know, Trump went to Singapore, instant pudding, microwave dinner, it's done, uh, you know, peace is breaking out all over. Uh, and we can't operate that way. We have to think of it as the beginning, and this is, has got to be a process that will stretch over several years. And finally, as I think you pointed out, and I, I think this is very much the case, the Koreans themselves will take the lead. And I think that's very obvious with President uh, Moon, and we need to support him. It's his country. It's not part of the United States. We've got about 10 minutes, I think. Please, go ahead. Uh, my question is about a comment that Mr. McGregor made actually during his opening remarks and alluded to a few times since, but other panelists are more than welcome to chime in if they also have thoughts on the matter. And that comment is the belief that in the long term, South Korea, not North Korea, is the more probable partner for China on the Korean Peninsula. So two questions from that. The first is, is that assessment based largely on the projections for what South Korea's economy is going to look like going forward? And the second question is, do you have a sense of what the time frame looks like for that transition uh, towards South Korea becoming more of a reliable partner from China? Because it seems that in a world where China is uh, much more solidly aligned with the South than they are the North, that certainly changes uh, the calculus for the, the leverage that North Korea has, the level of protection that they have, which might uh, really weaken their bargaining position in dealing with the United States and trying to maintain uh, sort of their nuclear program and all of the other uh, more illicit things going on in that country? Uh, well, first of all, it's not just a question of economics, although that obviously has a major impact. And all you have to do is look at the trade between China and South Korea to appreciate how important that is. It's also a matter of stability. Uh, anyone who thinks that President Xi 
is delighted with KJU and his potential for erratic behavior and potentially destabilizing actions is crazy. Again, it depends on what you think about the Chinese. I do not see the Chinese as interested in sparking a war in Northeast Asia against anyone. And remember that when you look at places like Taiwan or the Korean Peninsula, those are within the defense perimeter of Japan. The Japanese are not idle. The Japanese are not going to sit by and allow a major conflict to break out involving the Chinese on the Korean Peninsula or an attack on Taiwan without responding. Everybody knows this. In other words, the, the, the knowns in Asia are widely understood. So I think if you're Xi, you, you have to make a choice at some point because the other place is a drain on you. It's draining resources, it's draining patience, and it's causing you consternation that you would rather avoid. The, the only state that benefits from North Korea's continued existence in a perverse sort of way is Russia. I, I, I don't have the expertise on this, and I'm always interested to hear what Gordon has to say on this, but I, I find Doug's arguments very persuasive. Please. Kirk Couchman with Defense Priorities. There's a 23 times income disparity between the North and the South. If there's some sort of a rapprochement and economic integration, um, at what point will the North stop being able to prevent mass migration to the south and how will that change the region? I think you've hit the nail on the head. Uh, the long term, everything favors South Korea. Everything favors Seoul. I think it's a, it's a magnet that uh, the North is not going to be able to resist. I think KJU knows that. Uh, you know, whether or not the emperor in Beijing will provide him with a villa on the outskirts of Shanghai when the time comes is another matter. I can't, I, I, I can't imagine why he wouldn't. That may well turn out to be the case at some point. I just don't see the, the violence breaking out that we're accustomed to in many other societies because I think the, the various societies abhor that and don't want to go down that path no matter how profound their differences are. I, I don't have any expertise. I, I, I don't know the answer. But I, I must say I'm a little, I think the situation is a little less stable, perhaps, than, than what Doug's answer might have just implied. I think, that, I think there's so many, there's millions of people in a very desperate situation in, in North Korea. And I, I, that's why I think it's not in our interest to increase instability in the North Korean regime. You don't have to. I mean, it's already we, there. It, that's what it, so it's, I'd be very so hesitant about, about playing around too much with these scenarios. I think you brought up a very important issue, and I think this is why, going back to my earlier comment about if, even if Kim Jong-un was this different person, a different leader who wanted to transform his country and economically develop, he's going to, sooner or later, face the same challenges that his father was facing. Because to really open up, he means it has to open up in terms of information, you need to investment, you know, and when you really open up, and the country now learns of, I mean, they already know information mm -hmm. going into North Korea, um, there's a freer, richer South Korea that's right there. So how can, so is Kim Jong-un that kind of leader, right? So even if he wanted to, is he that kind of transformative leader with that kind of vision that's going to allow, because that's going to now risk the whole dynastic succession, regime stability, that he has to let go of that to be that kind of leader. So is there any evidence that he's that kind of leader? So that's, that's where I go back to sort of and challenge those people who say Kim Jong-un can because I think he's going to face those challenges as he moves even on this path of economic reform. And what about other things? Are all these other things gonna come to him like a tsunami? What about human rights issue? What about putting up political prison camps? It's just gonna, and he's gonna be faced with this and I don't think right now there's no end indication to me that he's that kind of visionary transformative leader. So I think you had a question. That's gonna be the final do, one, do we, Yeah, do we know uh, much about uh, Kim's opposition and his support inside North Korea? <laughs> it's, uh, that's very hard to know. And, and just as an analyst, as an intelligence analyst who's been dealing with this even before Kim Jong-un, it's one of the hardest things to know because by the time we find out that there is some sort of opposition, 
they know it. <laughs> it uh, so it's hard to like, if a coup would have happened after the fact, right? It's mm -hmm. really hard to know as an intel person. That kind of intelligence is very hard to, uh, it's, it's, it's almost impossible. But that said, I think Kim Jong-un has been doing a pretty good job getting rid of anybody who could pose a serious challenge to him. This is why he got rid of Jang Sang-tok. It's part of the reasons. This is one of the reasons why he got rid of Kim Jong-nam. And this is why he's been purging left, right, and center since, since he came into power. So if there was anybody who could, he's been busy getting rid of them. And he has also replaced a lot of people with loyalists who's loyal to him. So I think he's okay in terms of having consolidated power. And I don't, I don't think we can really, we know of any kind of real opposition to Kim Jong-un right now. Well, I mean, don't we have to say also when we start talking about how, how he has systematically eliminated any potential candidates who could compete with him yeah. or, or whatever, that's an old Korean practice in North Korea that goes back a thousand years. This is not new. Uh, so I don't, I mean, we, we may say it's Stalinist, but it's deeply ingrained in North Korea. This is, this is not a development. You know, uh, I was sitting in that assessment for six weeks trying to finish my doctoral dissertation in 1986, and after I was through, I, I, because I, I was there to look at a lot of intelligence that Bill Odom had asked me to examine, and I remember looking at the theater balance, you know, about the Soviets versus Europe. And after everything I'd looked at, I, I looked at this balance, I said, this is ridiculous. Uh, the Soviet armed forces and their alleged integrated uh, formations from the other Czechoslovak, Pola, Poland, Polish, and German are incapable of doing any of these things. And the thing that was striking was the immediate refusal to accept that. And so if you looked at the, the assessment that went forward, in 1986, it looked like the one from 1979 or 1980. In other words, there was no willingness, no, no agile thinking, if you will, uh, that said, no, you know, things really have changed profoundly, particularly since the declaration of martial law in Poland. Uh, that goes on here a lot. And then, you know, people, I, I remember sitting, to, listening to Henry Kissinger. I asked a question at the Council of Foreign Relations. You know, I think the Germans are on the verge of reunification. Will you care to comment? Oh, that's absolutely impossible. Nothing will happen for at least 20 years. Next question. So uh, to answer the question, we can't know with absolute precision. It's impossible. That's why I don't like to play Nostradamus. But I, wouldn't, would, I would be prepared for uh, unanticipated developments. And I think with that, we're going to leave it there. I want to thank everybody for sticking with us the whole day or coming to one panel. I think it was great. Thank you.